we being we humans are an amazing species, which we all of us, of course, know that. And we've been able to live in kinds of extremes that nature has afforded us. We occupy the entire planet. We live in the coldest regions, the hottest regions, and we've been able to adapt. And most of it has been because of us engineers. We've been able to technologically change the environment to suit our requirements and to suit our needs. And how have we done this all this while? What we have done is we have taken the materials that nature has given us, we have manipulated them, and we have used them in ways that are useful for us. But recently, we have gotten some new superpowers. So let me just give an example on what I'm getting to. Now, in this room, there are lots of wires and lots of electricity is flowing around. And what is it flowing with? What's the metal we are using? It's copper and aluminum. And how do we get these metals? We go out, we find mines, we then remove the copper and aluminum, we purify it, and we draw it out as wires, and then we use it. The copper is known to be a good conductor, but is it an ideal conductor? What do you say? So it's not the perfect conductor. It's something that nature has given us that we have to play with. So it's kind of like we are limited by what nature gives us. We're taking the best of what we can find from nature, and we use it. Now imagine being able to create materials the way you want them. Imagine being able to create a conductor that is way better than copper, cheaper and lighter, and being able to synthesize it with your minds without having to depend on anything that nature has to give you. Imagine being able to create new life which nature cannot create right now, artificial life, and that's what nanotechnology does. Nanotechnology is all about creating new things, creating new stuff from your minds. You essentially get to play God. And in this field, you engineer with the atoms as your building blocks. So you manipulate individual atoms, individual molecules, and you build out new stuff from that. That's what this is all about. Now, atoms are really, really small, and we deal with something that's on a smaller scale. So we we deal with a material called carbon nanotube. Now, carbon nanotubes are tiny tubes of carbon. They're so small that you can fit one lakh of these tubes in a single hair strand. So to get an even better idea. Imagine five hydrogen atoms. That's the diameter of these tubes, and they get to be really long, about a meter long. So if I had them in my fist, it can extend all the way to Mars. Just the size of it. That's the aspect ratio of these tubes. Now these tubes are an amazing material. They have some incredible properties. The first time these properties were predicted were by Arthur C. Clarke in the 70s in a book that he wrote about. It's called Contents of Paradise. He wrote about a concept saying that if we had a strong material. And if we could make it from diamond fibers, then we could build structures in space and build a bridge from outer space to them. And so he envisioned such a material. And now, with the technology, we're able to create the, just that material. These are diamond fibers that Arthur Clarke was envisioning back then. And we now are able to create them. And, at, and along with that, this material exhibits some incredible properties with the strength. It's a thousand times more conductive than copper is. It's also a hundred times stronger than steel in strength, and it's ten times lighter. And it also has some more uh, uh, superlatives to it. It's one of the best field emitters. Now we had these CRT televisions, right? Some time back, the CRT televisions use an electron emitter. So what they do is they apply a high voltage, which produces electrons from which you get the screen and colors and all that. Now each of these nanotubes is an electron emitter. Each of them is a cathode ray tube. And there are some more incredible applications that I'll be getting to shortly. Now at NOPO, that's the startup that I work in. We are developing technologies for mass producing this material on a on a very large scale. Now, imagine manufacturing something whose size is five hydrogen atoms, and producing billions and billions and billions of them, all having the exact same size, the exact same diameter. Because if you change one atom in that, its properties change entirely. Now, this material can be the ideal semiconductor, it can be the best solar cell material, or it can be the best conductor. And it's just one atom away from being either of them. And so we have developed technologies for producing this material on such a large scale consistently, and we've been doing it for two years now. Now, before us, this material was discovered about 25 years ago, and it was a work that led to Nobel prizes. But no other group in the world was able to consistently manufacture the material. Everyone would make them, but the next time they make the material, it was not the same. It used to be different, and no one could figure out how to do that. And so we did that with our systems. Now, what you see here are some of the reactors that we have in a in a plant. So it's mostly a small shed where we have all these reactors, lots of technology going inside. And so in this system, we take a carbon-containing gas. So it's anything like carbon monoxide, and we compress it to very high pressure. So the high pressure here is about one kilometer of water. You can imagine that having one kilometer of water. That's the pressure we have inside, and we heat it to a fourth of the sun's surface temperature. That's a thousand degrees. 
Uh, and when we do that, we send in something called a catalyst. It's just iron and nickel particles inside. Because of these high temperatures and pressures, that particle is broken down into single atom. And on that single atom, the tube-like structure is formed. And to maintain consistency, we need to send the same exact amount of catalyst every time, the exact same amount of carbon gases, the exact same temperature and exact same pressure. Now, to get an even better idea on imagining this, you have all seen rocket engines, right? Now, a rocket engine is designed to operate for 600 seconds. And our system operates at, at conditions similar or even worse than a rocket engine. It has to operate for months together without breaking down. That's the challenge here. And we have done that now. Now, this is the carbon nanotubes under a 1.25 lakh zoom. So, at that zoom, you can start seeing the fibers. Now, this is a microscope called a scanning electron microscope, and that's something called a transmission electron microscope. So, there are, it's just different ways of looking at it. We just pass light to the electrons through it, or just reflect off it and look at the images. Uh, it, that can resolve uh, better. Uh, maybe with the lights a little bit dimmer, we could probably see those tube-like structures there. Now, at this resolution, there's a funny thing that happens. The microscopes are so sensitive that see, these images were taken at CMTI, which, was, which is on Tumku Road in Bangalore itself. Uh, so, so the, the microscope is in a basement, it's a mi G minus 2 floor and at that floor it has a 20 foot uh, drop where they have isolated it with lots of concrete and everything. Uh, because we reached these zoom levels, if someone upstairs on second floor was walking around, those vibrations were sufficient to move around the electron beam and cross burning the images. That's how tiny this is, just someone walking on the second floor. They can uh, affect the measurements. So we thought of taking further measurements in the evening time when there's no one around that. So this is what we do. Now, to get to this point, it's been quite a, a, a strange journey. So we started four years ago, and we started with no technology in hands. We wanted to develop everything from scratch here. So earlier people used to just create lab scale equipment and say, okay, we have produced a nanotube, but they would only be producing milligrams of the material. And if I'm producing milligrams of it, no one's going to see a big change in their life. It's just going to make me get some more papers and a few patents probably. But we want to produce tons of this material. And to get there, we had to try a lot of different things. So initially, we used to try out something called the quartz tube, what you see on the left there. It's a glass mid kind of material that can withstand high temperatures. The funny thing is, if you were to hit it hard today, it won't break today. And it won't break tomorrow. It will break a year after or two years later, but it will break whenever it wants. So when we are running a system and we are confident that nothing bad is going to happen, it's going to break. And that's what happened to that many a time. And we had to face that and then we decided, okay, this is probably not a good idea to be to have something that's so unpredictable. So we started trying out different materials. Then we faced even more problems. These are some of the heaters we used. Uh, so they're supposed to heat up to 1000 degrees, but instead they just melted down. So the temperatures had reached 1600 degrees there. Uh, th that's enough to just boil down everyone. And th these are the furnaces, and then more quartz tubes breaking down. The images are not really visible. And we also use some gases like hydrogen. Uh, how many of you have seen a hydrogen gas burn? Okay, I just describe it. Uh, when you go home, look it up on YouTube. Okay, one person back. Great. Uh, so when hydrogen gas burns, it burns without producing a flame. So you have something that's burning, that's really hot, that you can't see. And you can just pass through it, and it'll be burnt. That's, that's how dangerous it is. So we use hydrogen in some other processes for clearing up the catalyst and stuff. This is after it has passed through with some contaminants. You can see a yellow flame there. But otherwise, it's just really transparent right there. And after all these failures, we went through something like 56 system designs. 56 times we just put back a system, run it, lose it, let's try it, run it back again, and build a great junkyard. And after that, we got our first nanotubes. So in this image, there's actually a small fiber there. That's one of our first carbon nanotubes that was really good. And now, with feedback from our clients in Japan and the US, we know that we make the world's best carbon nanotubes. We make the world's smallest nanotubes, the longest, and the best ever produced. And, and we believe that in the next two to three years, you're going to start seeing real products from carbon nanotubes in the market, hopefully your cell phones and all other devices. Now, when you have a material that's just stronger than steel, you can think of lots of applications. Now let's say you have steel. When we got steel, we started building these huge railway tracks. We have built skyscrapers and whatnot. And with copper, we have been able to build out complete telephone lines that connect every part of the world. And we also get our broadband connections even now through copper lines. But imagine something that's a thousand times better than copper. That's a hundred times stronger than steel. And that's way better than any material in all aspects. And that's a single material that we create, uh, that's created by humans. 
So you can imagine the huge range of applications that this can do. So we can build new composites, lighter aircraft, lighter cars, and lighter vehicles, which are far more efficient. We can also build solar cells. Now this material is a, me a metallic, which can be a thousand times more conductive than copper, or it can be a semiconductor. And it is the best semiconductor ever. So what it does is, if you were to build a solar cell with carbon nanotubes, you get to absorb the entire solar spectrum, not just the visible light. You get to absorb everything from ultraviolet to infrared. So in, in, technically and potentially, you could have a solar cell in this room that just works. by just using the heat in this room by absorbing the infrared radiation. And that's feasible with carbon nanotubes. And when you do a theoretical calculation, they have an efficiency of 95%. That is way beyond anything. And people have already fabricated devices by mixing them with silicon, and they've got an efficiency of 56%, which is unheard of. Normal solar cells that we get off the market, they have an efficiency of 10%. So that's the kind of change we're looking at. And when you use them in chips, we can make them even smaller and even better. We can make transistors that are one nanometer in size. That's the gateway, instead of the 12 or 15 nanometers that we have right now. And that this is touted to be the next generation of materials that is going to replace silicon. And lots of work is happening on that too. Now at NOCO, we work on a lot of applications, and I'll be coming to them in just a little while. Now let's look at another application that is one of my favorites. Now we have radios, and radios are everywhere, in our cell phones, in our FM radios, everywhere. Now radios have been getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now people at Berkeley in California in 2007, they're just trying to see how the radios could be made even smaller. They're just playing around, they thought, okay, uh, what if we build a complete radio with one carbon nanotube? What if you make it a lot times smaller than the human hair itself and what will happen to that? So they just did that as an experiment. They took a bunch of carbon nanotubes, they put it on a, or they just made a truck kind of thing, they just put a bunch of nanotubes, burned off everything and had one carbon nanotube stay. That's the one that's standing there. And then they observed an interesting phenomena. When they applied radio waves, the nanotubes started vibrating. These guys are so small that they vibrate due to radio waves. And when the nanotubes vibrate, they also have another weird effect. They produce more electrons. They do something called field emission. Uh, so so uh, normally when we want to produce electrons, what we do is we take a tungsten or some other material, we heat it to a high temperature, something like 2000 or 3000 degrees, then we apply massive voltages like 1000 or 2000 volts, then we get the electrons from it. But in this case, you just need a few volts, one or two volts, and you have the electrons and you have a complete radio. It just vibrates, produces electrons, and if you were to just log into this, look for Zettel Group on Berkeley, and you can find a video on how this radio works. You can listen to the music there, and there are some really geeky stuff there. It's outstanding. You have Star Wars music playing off it. So that's the one. Another great application is composites. Now this is something that we are working on at Nobo, where we are creating new materials. Now there's been a fab of 3D printing, where people are printing out stuff in plastics. Now we have developed technologies to print out metals. And instead of processing them at high temperatures, we make them at very low temperatures. At just 150 or 200 degrees, we can create metals. And what we found was that we could embed nanotubes inside the metal to enhance its strength, its conductivity, and its corrosion resistance. These alloys are about four times stronger than steel is right now, but they expect to get even stronger over time. And they're much easier to fabricate. So if someone wants a complex shape, we can just print it out for them. And the, the accuracy is measured in atoms rather than millimeters or centimeters. So you, you can get anything out of it. So a lot of machine shops could go away once it comes to mainstream markets. Now, another question is, now we've been working on these technologies. I spoke about solar cells and all these field emitters and all that. Now, why pursue that? So what's the motivation for a startup to be working on next-gen technologies? Most of the time people tell me that this is not for India and it should really be some, in somewhere else, some Western country. That's why it's going to get all the encouragement and stuff like that. Now, and I keep telling, okay, no, that's my interest. I'm just going to do it here. Uh, now, the motivation for us is a problem that's going to face us very, so very soon. It's going to face our generation more than anyone. As India becomes a developed country, as we become more and more developed, there's one commodity which we want more and more of, and that's energy. So as we are, and right now, our energy sources are all really bad. So we think of electric cars, but when we use an electric car, the energy is being produced by coal plant, which is polluting even more than a gasoline car. So we want to solve this problem. Now coal is bad, and recently in our central government, they set up a couple more coal plants. And so what's happening is we get the energy, we sit here happily, but someone, somewhere else, we're just spewing lots of carbon dioxide, sulfur, 
destroying our own environment and killing ourselves eventually. And other forms of energy are really not up to the mark. We have solar, which can produce energy, but can only do it when the sun is up there, not when the sun is not there. And we have nuclear fusion, which, is facing, which has been facing its own problems. The Fukushima reactor, it had backup of a backup of a backup plan, and all three backups failed in, the, in Japan, and they had to shut it down. And once a nuclear fusion reactor blows up, the whole area is useless. You can't do anything there for several centuries. And fusion has been something that people have been trying for a really long time with little success. So now, fusion is something that just involves lots of laughter because it never really has happened. So what we are focusing on is on the world's best fusion reactor. Could someone guess which is that? Yeah, it's been around for five or 10 billion years now. That's our sun. I just said solar is not good for us, and it's again going back to sun. But the idea is, instead of waiting for the sun rays to fall on Earth and then tap into their energy, what if we put up a solar panel in space right in a region where the sun's energy does not become zero? What if we put it up in, right up in space? And that idea is called a space-based solar power plant. And this was first proposed in the 70s by a scientist called Peter Glazer. Now, this idea has been studied extensively by almost all the space agencies. Everyone has done feasibility studies. They've seen it, the components work and all that. And even day for yesterday, the Japanese space agency, they kind of ate another test to prove that the system is viable. Now, technically, there is no doubt about the systems working. And a quick Google search will tell you that all the systems, all the components, everything required to make the system work is available right now, except for something small. That's the money. Now, now getting this satellite up to space is going to be very, very expensive. And uh, so these are some of the math calculations there. What people have found is that in the 70s technology, this thing to replace one of the large coal plants would weigh 20,000 tons. Now putting 20,000 tons in space with current launch cost, the cheapest, is going to cost us about 12 lakh crore rupees. Whereas a coal plant of the same capacity is going to cost us about 12,500 crores. This is just, I just got those numbers from Google and from the new coal plants that have been sanctioned. So you can see the numbers there. So that's 100 times more expensive and no one's, going to, no one's willing to put so much of money right now. So if somehow the cost of such a satellite could be reduced, it becomes more and more feasible. And that's what we are doing right now. With all the technologies we are developing, with the carbon nanotubes, with the solar cells, the field emitters, and the composites, we are reducing the weight and mass of this satellite, all the way from 20,000 tons to more measly 50 tons, with the same capacity, with much lighter components, and far more efficient components. And every research work that we carry on in the company, every little thing we do, is going to eventually fit into this large zigzag puzzle and solve this problem. And we believe that within the next seven years, we should be able to have all components in final readiness. We're also keeping an eye on all the launch options, all the private companies working at launching these satellites. And including those costs, it's turning out to be cheaper than coal. So within the next decade is what we want to accomplish these things. And that decade started in 2009 for us when we started this company. So we've been working on that for the last four years, developing the carbon nanotubes, developing the composites, and also giving out nanotubes to research groups working on solar cells and also on all aspects, even the electronics. We give out nanotubes to a lot of researchers in the world. And all of them are able to get some really good results. And eventually, we expect all of those to come back and get back into this satellite right here. Now, it just seems crazy, mind-boggling, and it's just impossible and stuff. But what we do is we don't look at it as a task of launching a rocket and putting a satellite up there. We, look, we break it down into smaller tasks, smaller, more manageable tasks, and we look at each task one at a time and then accomplish that. And once we have finished a smaller task, the whole bigger picture is getting more and more green dots. When it's finally complete, we have everything in place.